Well, good evening, and thank you for joining us again. This is our last segment for Psalm 131. We've yeah. spent several weeks here, and it's been good. It's been good for me to just spend time in God's Word in this psalm. It's a chapter, but it's only three verses. But then not only here, talking about it and reading it, but as I go home and think about it as well. I don't know how many times it's come up just in talking with my wife or even with my kids. Just remember Psalm 131, remember what we learned there. So that's been really helpful, and I pray it's been a blessing to you. We're going to open up with a word of prayer, and Tom's going to do that. And then he's going to give us just a quick summary of where we've been as we look to conclude tonight. Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for Psalm 131. Thank you that we've been able to spend so much time in your word growing and learning from these short verses. And I pray that you would continue to drive this truth home into our hearts, into our lives even, that we would live out what we see in Psalm 131. Be with us now tonight as we conclude and apply some things. I pray that you would speak through your word, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let me read Psalm 131 real quick, these three verses, and then maybe we'll back up and review and then finish things up. So Great. Psalm 131, verse 1 says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself. As a child that is weaned of his mother, my soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. Hmm. So really these verses are, are simple. The, the words haughty, mine eyes lofty, those point us towards our pride. And so if you remember back several weeks ago, we spent, I think it was a couple weeks, really focused in thinking about our pride, how it shows itself in our lives um, this writer uses the example of ladders that we set up in our lives and we try to climb to achieve some sort of goal, thinking mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. if we can achieve that goal, that it'll fulfill some right. desire in our lives. Different kinds of ladders. Yeah. yeah. Ladders of success. We talked about those some mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago, um, even ladders of avoidance. Mm -hmm. And really, he talks about the fact that these ladders are basically actually set up in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. they, they don't go anywhere. We climb them, and when we get to the top, we realize 
There's nothing there. In real life, I don't like to be up on a ladder too high, especially when there's not stable ground. But this is literally a ladder we set out in the middle of nowhere. Nothing's holding it. And we try and go up as fast as we can before it falls over. It always falls over. Yeah. So verse 1 points us towards our pride. Um, David is actually saying in verse 1 that he is not proud and he doesn't exercise himself in great matters or in things too high for him. So this is really the, the result. And then verse 2, he gives us the process. David says, Surely I have behaved and quieted myself. As a child is weaned of his mother, my soul is even as a weaned child. So we spent some time thinking about this process of resting, not, not just forcing ourselves to be quiet, we can't just manufacture victory over anxiety or pride, mm-hmm. but talking about the fact that it's a, a resting in our God. It's, he gives the picture in verse 2 of a child that knows a parent so well that they'll just rest. In fact, um, my daughter, uh, mm-hmm. there are times, not all the time, mm-hmm. but there are moments where maybe you've experienced this where my daughter will just come and lay on my chest she knows me. She knows who I am. She knows that nothing else matters and that she can rest and be quiet. Those, right. those are sweet moments. Right. And that's kind of the picture he's giving us in verse 2. And then verse 3, the, the ending there, let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever, reinforcing the fact that we don't do this ourselves. It mm-hmm. points us towards our Lord. He is our hope. He is where our rest is found. Right. So that's just the quick review. Uh, I think we've spent four or five weeks in this. Let's finish it up. Yeah, tonight we're going to be talking about some application. So as we think about this application, we're, we're finishing this, and there's a couple quotes that we're going to pick out and talk about. We're not going to read the entire last segment here. Um, it's great. If you'd like to read it, we can get you a copy, and you can read it as well. But I think it's good for us to actually not read it all, but just take some main points and consider them. Because we want this to be something that we think about and live out in our life, not just something we read and say, wow, that was good, now what, now I'm done. No, we want to meditate on this. And this is actually practicing what the psalmist is doing as well. How he got to where he was by God's grace is the same thing that we want to do. So we're going to take turns. I'm going to pick out a quote, and Pastor Tom will pick out a quote, and we will just talk about it and see if we can encourage one another and encourage you as you're listening um, on how we can live those things out and how they apply to us on a day-by-day basis. So the first one I'm going to pick out is this. After we talk about the fact that these ladders that we set up that really don't hold us up and ultimately end up falling over, he says, uh, second, come to know Jesus. That's, that's his admonition to us. We have to come to know Christ. And the latter is really a good example for us because if it's not resting on something solid, it will be shaky and it will tip over. And we've talked about this before, how there is a sure foundation. Christ himself is that sure foundation. God himself is the, the person and the, the person of truth that we build off of. And so we need to come to know Christ. He never climbed the ladders to nowhere. He is the uh, iconoclast, the ladder toppler, the idol breaker. And I think you actually had picked that sentence out as well, right? Yeah. So why don't you just go right into that and explain what this means, why it's so important that we come to know Jesus. So come to know Jesus. He never climbed the ladders to nowhere. He's the ladder toppler, the idol breaker, the lie piercer, the pride smasher, the eyes lower the mouth stopper. Jesus Christ here in this paragraph, but all throughout Scripture and in our lives is the exact opposite of everything that we try to do. Mm -hmm. We try to find success in and of ourselves, and God and His Son Jesus Christ actually, as as shocking as it sounds, He actually short circuits Mm. our success Mm -hmm. in several ways. Maybe He... he, he removes that success from us. He doesn't let us attain it. Or mm-hmm. maybe he lets us achieve that, but then he gives us the realization that it didn't hold anything. Mm-hmm. So as he's calling us to come to know Jesus, he is so far different, so far better. He is the one that smashes those idols. He's the one that wants to replace them. Um, and it actually, it's really helpful because 
anytime you take something out, you're going to need to put something else in its place. Mm-hmm. And that's where Jesus comes in. This is a really refreshing truth. And in some instances, it can make you feel apprehensive because all that you thought was helping you, um, you're making a decision. Scripture's telling us it's not helping, but then we're actually decisively making a decision. I believe this. I believe these things that I've been trusting in aren't actually giving me the security that I thought that they were. And so it's kind of an apprehensive thing, but then you don't just take them away. Like you said, there's something else that comes. And whenever that realization comes, it's refreshing to know that I don't have to be continually searching for a sure place to set up my ladder, so to speak, but it's there and it's just rock solid. The last sentence he says is, it goes against everything we innately cherish. It gives us something worth cherishing forever. I mean, that's the trade-off. Uh, I don't know how many people have written things explaining this very truth where what we think is so valuable and necessary and important and we elevate when we come to know God and his word, specifically Christ and what he's done for us, that is, the trade-off is just incomparable. Um, and, And that's what he's calling us to rest in. This isn't some ambiguous or confusing abstract thought. This is the person of Christ. Yeah. who he declares himself to be and what he's already done. That's very refreshing for us. And it helps even to bring us back to that um, picture of verse 2, Psalm 131, verse 2, and that child right. Right. who, when, as a child, when you're weaned and you know your parent's going to provide for you, you know your mother's going to feed you, mm-hmm. and you don't have to reach for these other things. You can just rest. You're satisfied. Mm-hmm. You've gotten what you need. It, it just points us back to that picture. Um, it's worth cherishing forever. Right. Good Good stuff. Uh, something we need to work on on a regular basis. Yeah. It's a daily daily struggle, daily pursuit. But that's that's where God wants us. So it's a good thing for us to remember. Do you have any quotes here? I got some marked, but I'll, I'll give you the next turn. Go for it. Okay. Um, a little bit later here, talking about, he's talking about authority now and talking about how ultimately Christ is our authority. He's not just something we use. <laughs> but he himself is our treasure and also our authority. And so therefore our life is structured around him. And that just makes sense. Uh, Psalm 131 overthrows the powers that be in order to establish the reign of him who is. And we've talked about this, but whenever we're living life, it is easy for us to, it's easy for our minds to go to the possibilities Um, when what we need to do is draw our mind back to what is, uh, what what is true, what God has declared to us. How can we do that on a regular day-by-day basis? Um, Really just a great place to start would be meditating on Scripture. Mm -hmm. Even just bringing ourselves back to what God's Word says, praying it back to our God, reminding ourselves of who's in control through our prayers, what do you think? Well, what you just said, I want to I want to camp on for a little bit. Okay, put up a tent, got a little campfire. <laughs> you said something that I think is helpful for us. How do we pray back prayers to God from God's word? I'm not looking for necessarily specific examples, but um, maybe maybe you're sitting there and you thought you think I I've never thought of that before. I don't even know what that would mean. So what does that mean? Because I think that's a really good thing to do, and I would like to actually do it more than I already do. But I remember at one point in my life never even having that as a thought, yeah. and then somebody suggesting it. It's like, that's kind of different. I think that'd be helpful, but yeah. I'm not sure if I'm used to that. So yeah. what does that mean? Um, well, Psalm 131 actually can be a prayer, and there's many others throughout Scripture. You can take a specific prayer, from Scripture, and you can just use that as a prayer and pray it right back to God, the Lord's Prayer. Hmm. But you can also take Scripture like Psalm 131 and use it as an opportunity to say, God, I want this. Hmm. So, Lord, I I see pride in my own life. Lord, help me not to be proud. Help help me not to climb these worthless ladders. Lord, I pray that you would let me see you for who you are Hmm. and just to be weaned, to be quieted, to just sit and rest in the lap of our God. Hmm. 
and then come to verse 3 and say, God, I, I'm praying this back to you, and God, I, I want to rest and hope in you. Please help me to do this. Lord, I know that you hear my prayers. I know that you will answer according to your will. Lord, I desire this. This is what your word says. Please help me. And so Psalm 131 isn't necessarily worded as a prayer, but in that moment right there, I just walk through verse 1, 2, 3 of right. what it could look like to pray right. it back to God. Right, so v verse 3, as I'm reading this, let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. I mean, I could pray that prayer, Lord, I want to trust you in everything that you have told me. Lord, in fact, I want to know more of what you've said about yourself. Give me a desire for your word. Help me to trust you. Help me to not just trust you today, but tomorrow and forever. Yeah. So reflecting on that truth and de declaring it to be your desire for yourself. And I think God uses his word in that way to change us. Um, God doesn't just change us somehow haphazardly. Uh, he uses his word and he uses us looking at and concentrating, meditating on his word for that word to wash over us. And so it has to be a continual process where it's not just the first time I read it, I get it always. <laughs> I can understand what it says the first time I read it, but sometimes I actually need to say that Monday, looking at what Monday gives me, but then Tuesday might give me something different. And God knows all about that, but for me to say that on Monday might be very easy, but for me to say that on Tuesday might be difficult, which is why it's good for me to be meditating on it, to be thinking and saying that truth over and over, because I get to see how that truth applies itself on every different kind of circumstance in every kind of a day. Yeah, that's where it's helpful, um, like you were just saying, but it's helpful to come back to a passage over and over and over again, mm -hmm. kind of like we've done for weeks with Psalm mm -hmm. 131, right. because what I learned in week one and what I'm learning now might be a little bit different, and it's definitely going to be applied a little bit different because my mm -hmm. life looks different now than it did several weeks ago. Right. Um, the next quote I had actually kind of goes along. So speaking still of Jesus, of Psalm 131, says he exposes both the self-righteously complacent and the self-righteously suspicious. Mm -hmm. He turns all the inner worlds upside down. So just talking about the fact that God's word, as we spend time in it and as we apply it to our lives, it will work and do different things for different people and at different times in life. Mm -hmm. And here, this quote, I think is so helpful, just that it exposes on two sides, both the self-righteously complacent and then the self-righteously suspicious. So I thought that was a helpful quote. Yeah, and even right before that, um, it says that when he's doing this, God's word is like a light, and Scripture tells us that, and it exposes what's there, and it also uh, tells us what is true. And so just, just realizing that this, again, this isn't just going to happen on accident, but God is going to reveal these realities that, that live deep within our heart as we're reading and spending time in God's word. The sentence right before says, he turns all the inner worlds upside down. Um, he, uh, Jesus unveils the inner worlds, each and all, and floods hearts with light. So he's bringing Again, what is, what is true to my, to my heart that is so easily distracted and so easily satisfied with lesser things. And that's, that's, that's something that is a good thing for us to realize. If we yeah. don't realize that, we will always be struggling in some way. Um, so that's, that's very helpful. Good point. Yeah. Well, as we conclude here one final word and he talks about meditation specifically and so just for the last few minutes here I think it would be good for us to consider the different ways and different places where we can meditate on God's word and what that looks like sometimes it's easy for us to just get one concept of this in our mind maybe because we've done it before so maybe maybe a person's idea of Meditating on scripture or memorizing scripture might just be as a kid in a, in, a, in a kids club, Bible kids club, and so you're taking verses, and if you memorize them, you get something at the end of the week, and that's a great thing. And even here at, at Kids for Truth, we want to instill truth into kids' lives, and so they're doing that. But is that the only way to, to memorize or to meditate on scripture? 
there's more. Yeah. And, and as we grow as Christians, we should, I've not thought about this before, so correct me if I'm wrong, but as we grow as Christians and as we grow as people, we should probably be finding new and different ways to put this truth back into our mind. Um, so here's a couple things that we're just going to read through and maybe talk about a little bit, and then we'll be done. It says, turn these words over in your mind. So just before we talk about this, explain what that means, to turn these words over in your mind and what that has to do with meditation. So often in our culture, uh, really actually in a lot of cultures, when you think about meditation, it's the idea of uh, maybe emptying your mind, maybe... Uh, because there's so much stuff in it. It's like, get everything yeah, out, let me have peace, just maybe clear like it a, out. a yoga pose or some kind of transcendent meditation and you just empty it all out. Yeah. And yet when you come to Scripture, and even if you look it up in the dictionary, meditation actually encompasses thinking, putting truth, mm. and just mulling over and inspecting that truth. So mm. a comparison is actually worrying. Mm. So mm-hmm. when you worry, you take one thing. So that's a kind of meditation. It is a type of meditation. Worrying is a bad meditation. Right. But you take this one thing and you just look at every possible side of it, everything that might happen, everything that could connect with anxiety, right. everything that may possibly be connected in any way. And that's actually the same idea of what God wants us to do with these words, with his word, is take with this what truth is true. and just look at every nuance, every side of it. Uh, so even as... Um, you look at Scripture, you see David in Psalm 119 just yeah. meditating on one truth. He actually is meditating on what it is to have God's Word. I mean, that's one thing. That must be the shortest psalm in the Psalms, right? <laughs> it's the longest. It's the longest one. By so again, far. meditating one thing over and over and over. A whole psalm, and he's just looking at God's Word over yeah. and over and over again. It's like yeah. a gemstone. Right. He's just turning and looking at all the facets of it. He just wants to know it perfectly and so well. Right. That's this meditation. So turn these words over in your mind. That's helpful because as we think about doing this, you may not understand how to do these things if you don't know that first. So he says, turn these over in your mind before drifting to sleep. That's something that I have done. I, I'm doing it some now, but I remember as a young teenager, I don't think anybody told me to do it, but I just started to do it. Before I, before I went to bed, I would spend time just thinking about the things I knew that were true about God and talking to him about those things. It was different for me because it wasn't like, dear God, thank you for this day. And thank you for the food. And I need this. It wasn't that kind of a prayer. It was, uh, God, you've, you've said that you were this. And that's just hard for me to understand. But this is what you've said about yourself. And I would just think about that as I was talking to him about it. And it was a refreshing way to fall asleep. Uh, so maybe doing that before you, fall to, before you fall asleep, meditating on God's Word. My wife and I actually try to make it a practice mm-hmm. every night um, as we lay down before we go to sleep that we finish our day mm-hmm. with prayer. Mm-hmm. And it's just, again, reminding ourselves of who God is, who's in control. Um, we need His help. And it's, it's a great way yeah. to end a day. It's a great way to begin a day. Sure. Sure, all of the above. Yeah. In fact, whenever we're just sitting here talking, we're working on something for our church body that is going to take the passage of Scripture that we're going to be considering during the week, uh, Sunday morning. And we want to spend more time throughout the week considering that truth, applying these principles to what we've seen in God's Word. Yeah. One of the things we want to do in that, which would be a weekly um, email that we send out to give people, would be an area where they can look at the text that we've been in, but then consider ways to pray about that text. And I would encourage specifically parents and dads, that's a great way to help put your kids to bed. As you spend time with them before they go to bed, praying with them, but then in your prayer, pulling from those truths and just praying them, I think it'll deepen and just make very rich your prayer life, and, and what you're thinking before you go to bed. Yeah. So another way that we can meditate on God's Word is um, before counseling someone. That's a good time to do it, but there's also a reason for doing it as well. 
So what if somebody's sitting there and they're thinking, well, I don't, I don't really counsel anybody. I'm not a pastor. Mm -hmm. What do you say? I would say that we all are counselors whenever we give advice. Whenever we're telling somebody what we believe to be true, we should be telling them what is true. And therefore, any advice or any counsel we give should come straight from our own meditation of Scripture. Um, it's easy for us to think, well, I'm not planning to be a counselor today, so therefore I, uh, I don't really need to spend that much time meditating on God's Word. If I knew I was doing that, then I would spend some more time in God's Word. But if you were to really were to just stop and think about it, number one, we have to counsel ourselves through yeah. all of life. So that's a 100% constant, sure thing in our life. But, you know, just stop and wonder, how, how often do I actually encourage someone else towards something? Um, how, how often do I give my opinion about what somebody should do? Somebody's struggling at work or a Whether family that's member. At a kitchen table? Or it could be a kitchen table. Could social be media? Or anywhere. Yeah. That's all the different ways. And so it's good for us, before we give advice to somebody, to know what is sure and what is true and what is right. Which is why we're coming back and saying that we need to be meditating on God's words. Exactly. Um, driving in your car when you approach God to talk. So I think that's helpful. It's, it's unique. So we need to meditate on God's Word before we approach God to talk to God. And that goes back to what we said before, and that is that informs how we talk to Him, how we think about Him. Instead of just coming with what I want, I'm coming to Him with who He is, which the Psalms do all the time. Uh, this is who you are, God, and so I praise you and I thank you for who you are. There's always petitions as well, but the petitions, what, what we're asking of God, is based on what God said that he is already doing or has already done. Yeah. And so it's good for us before we approach God to talk, before we pray. When you get noisy inside or for whatever reason, even gathering in public worship. So before I even come and learn from his word, it could be good to spend time in his word. Before I come and sing with God's people, it could be good to spend time in God's word so that my singing is informed. It's based on the truth of what God has declared about himself. So really, as we think about this, um, it might be helpful to even consider what we're listening to and what's coming into us. So mm -hmm. scripture and this author is encouraging us to meditate on God's word. Mm-hmm. And I would encourage us to even sit down and maybe take an inventory, maybe write it down and say, okay, what input am I getting this week? Mm. Um, think about radio and news, TV, um, podcasts that you listen to, movies that you watch, books that you read. We, ha we have a lot It's of literally words. any place, anywhere, anything. Yeah, there are a lot of words coming into our lives. Mm -hmm. And ultimately... We need to have God's word at the front. Mm -hmm. So even as we consider all the words swirling around us, even all the words that we speak to ourselves, mm -hmm. do they match up with, mm -hmm. are they grounded in, are they established on God's word? And coming back to our psalm here to conclude, I think what we can say is true is that if what we're allowing into our minds as far as the words and the things we hear and even the things we think about if those things don't sync up with what god's word says the implication is going to be the opposite of what we find here in psalm 131 yeah so with that in mind uh, tom why don't you read this one more time and then close us in prayer okay psalm 131 verse 1 lord my heart is not haughty nor mine eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself. As a child that is weaned of his mother, my soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you again for your word, for the opportunity to meditate on it this evening and to spend time just going through it. And I pray that you would drill it deep down into our hearts and lives, that we would not forget it. Help us as we memorize it. Help us as we seek to live it out. 
And I pray that you would help me, help me to be able to say like David that I am not proud because I am resting in you. You are my hope forever. I pray this in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Scriptures tell he roars by.